So we've seen that the first derivative can be used to show where a function's increasing or decreasing and where the extrema occur. Well, it turns out the second derivative gives us the rate of change of the first derivative. It indicates how fast the function is increasing or decreasing. So the rate of change of the derivative affects the graph. So think about that for a second. The derivative, the first derivative is the rate of change of the original function. The second derivative is the rate of change of the rate of change. So if we know how quickly the change is happening, then that also affects the shape of the graph. And this leads to a concept we've seen previously, which we called con uh, concavity. A function is concave upward on the interval a to b if the graph of the function lies above its tangent line. So let's think about that for a second. If you had a graph that is concave up, the way we usually think of it, because as we talked about this in a pre-calculus notion at the beginning of this lecture series, we, we understood concave up was to suggest that like your bucket um, is holding water, right? Your, the curve shape uh, is going up. Now it turns out that the proper definition of concavity is to do with tangent lines. If your function is curving upward, concave upward, then the tangent line is actually below the function, okay? Uh, on the other hand, if you are concave downward on the interval a to b, then that occurs if the tangent line is below the function, okay? And so the usual idea we have for concave down would look something like this. So this is our concave upward. And this is an example of our concave downward. And so this is describing the curvature of the graph. You could think of it if, if this was like a bucket of water. Um, well, the water would be coming down because it's, it's not holding the water whatsoever. But where are the tangent lines here? If I were to draw this function, if I, that is, if I drew a tangent line of the function, you see that the graph is concave down if the tangent line is above the function. So let's use Desmos as a tool to experiment with this idea of concavity. You can see on the screen this bluish green curve. Uh, this is the function f of x equals x cubed minus 3x. This is just meant as an example. And you can also see this orange line on the screen. This is the tangent line for our function. And I've programmed it so that as I move the point of tangency, it'll recalculate the the tangent line in real time. So you can see me manipulating the, the point and thus the tangent line moves along with it. Okay, so we've explained with this example before. Notice as, as we go from increasing to decreasing, you can see the tangent line switch its sign from positive to negative there. That meant you have a local maximum. As it's decreasing, then to increasing, you hit a local minimum. The derivative switched from positive to negative. That we saw with the first derivative test, but what about monotonicity? Now notice in this region right here where my tangent line is located, the tangent line is above the function. So that tells us that we are concave downward. And in fact, we're concave downward all the way here. When we pass the local maximum, our tangent line is still above the function. We are still concave downward. It doesn't seem to switch until about x equals zero. At x equals zero, it seems to switch sides. Notice now that my tangent line is, a, is below the curve and it will continue to be below the curve forever afterwards. So we see that when you are to the left of x equals zero, the tangent line is above the curve, so that means we are concave downward. When you pass x equals zero, that means our, my tangent line is actually now below the curve and we are, would be concave upward. There's something special about this point x equals zero. This is what we call a point of inflection. An inflection point is where you switch your concavity. We switch from being concave down to concave up. The inflection point is where the tangent line is able to switch sides. It switches from being above to being below the curve like so. And so I claim that this idea of concavity has something to do with the second derivative. So notice what's happening to my tangent line. If I start right here, my tangent line has very, it's really steep. So that's gonna be a large positive value. As I get closer and closer and closer to this local maximum, the tangent slope is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's x, it, then the tangent slope becomes zero, so the first derivative got smaller. So even though the first derivative is positive in this interval, the first derivative is decreasing. I'm not saying the function f is decreasing, I'm saying f prime is decreasing, okay? Once you get past the local maximum, you now look at your slope there, it's a negative slope, um, and then what happens as we move along further, 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 as we go along, it's going to get more negative, more negative, more negative until you hit x equals zero. Then x equals zero, 
it's going to start to go up again, right? So when you're to the left of zero, your, your tangent line is falling, 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 falling. That suggests that the second derivative is negative because if the tangent lines are falling, that means my first derivative is decreasing. Okay, once you get past zero, notice the, the the tangent lines are now rising. They're going up and up and up and up. That would suggest that the first derivative is increasing. Now, if the first derivative is increasing, that means the second derivative is positive. So let's summarize what we've seen um, in this with what we call the test of concavity here. Let f be a function with derivatives f prime and f double prime existing at all points in the interval a to b. If then f is going to be concave upward on the interval exactly when the second derivative is positive. Because a, an increasing derivative means that you're curving upward. And um, the function will be co concave downward if the second derivative is negative. And at an inflection point for a function f, the second derivative is going to be zero or does not exist. So that is the inflection points, the places where it switches concavities, those will occur at the critical numbers of the first derivative. And so we're gonna typically call those potential, uh, the potential points, oh, assuming I can spell any of these words today, uh, potential points of inflection. So the critical numbers of the first derivative, we're gonna call potential points of inflection, or just PPIs for short. A PPI is a potential point of inflection. The reason we say that is that critical numbers are not always extrema, but every extremum is gonna be of critical number. The, that same is also true for these points of inflection. The points of inflection are gonna be critical numbers of the first derivative. That is what makes the second derivative equal to zero, or D and E. Uh, but not every critical number of the first derivative will be a point of inflection. So we'll call them PPIs um, as opposed to calling them critical numbers again. The critical numbers are what make the first derivative go to zero or D and E. The PPIs are what makes the second derivative uh, be zero or does not exist. Let's illustrate this with an example. Let's find all the intervals where f of x, which is equal to x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 18x squared is concave upward or concave downward. And let's find all of the the points of inflection. So we have to calculate the second derivative to learn things about concavity. So the first derivative by the power rule, we're gonna get four X cubed minus 24 X squared plus 36 X. Um, we don't actually really need to worry about the critical numbers because we're not asking about monotonicity here. So we're gonna to proceed to calculate the second derivative then, which by the same calculation technique as before, we're gonna get the second derivatives 12 X squared minus 48 X plus 36. This is a polynomial. It's never going to be undefined, so we do need to see when it's equal to zero. We can factor out a, a, a coefficient factor of 12, leaving behind x squared minus 4x plus 3. So we need factors of 3 that add to negative 4, uh, so we can get x minus 3 and x plus uh, x minus 1. Excuse me. Negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3, but negative 3 plus negative 1 is equal to uh, negative 4. And so these are going to be our potential points of inflection, our PPIs. Uh, this is equal to 3 and 1. So we're going to build a number chart, a sign chart, just like we did with we did first derivative test to determine monotonicity and extrema. It's basically the same idea. We're just now using the second derivative. So we're going to be concerned with the PPI 1 and the PPI 3. So let's look at the factors of the second derivative. Well, one of the factors is 12. That's always going to be positive, so it's not too consequential. Then there's the next factor of x minus 3. It's, a it's an increasing linear function. It will be negative until it hits its x-intercept, which is at 3, so it'll switch to be positive. If you look at x minus 1, it'll be negative until it hits x equals 1, then it switches to be positive. So then when we put all these factors together, the second derivative, you get positive times negative times negative, that's a positive. You get positive times negative times positive, that's a negative. And you're going to get a triple positive, which is a positive. What this tells you about your first derivative is that the first derivative will be increasing when you're less than one, it'll be decreasing when you're between one and three, and it'll be increasing when you're past three. But we really don't care about the first derivative here. What we care about is the function f itself. If the second derivative is positive, that means that our fun function is concave upward. If the second derivative is negative, that means our function is concave downward. And if our second derivative is positive, it's going to be concave upward right there. So what we see is the following. So we see that f 
is concave upward. It's concave upward on the interval. We're going to get negative infinity to 1, union 3 to infinity. Um, we also see that it's going to be concave downward on the interval 1 to 3. So now we've identified the intervals where the function is concave upward and concave downward. What about points in inflection? Well, if you're going from concave up to concave down, right? If you're concave up to concave down, that's going to be a switch there. So we switch the signs. Uh, so basically, we get something like concave up to concave down. That looks like an inflection. But problem is, we don't actually know, is the function decreasing or is it increasing right here? Because uh, we actually didn't look into that information. Because it could look something like this. Maybe it was like decreasing. Uh, but maybe it's like concave up increasing. What would something look like like that? It could be some, doing something like this. We don't actually know. But the point is, we can look at the first derivative to figure out that information. But what we're going to do right now is just note, if you switch from concave up to concave down, that's an inflection. If you switch from concave, concave down to concave up, that's likewise an inflection here. So we see that F has inflection points. Has inflection points at the values x equals 1 and x equals 3. So one critical thing we want to mention here is that the points of inflection of f are exactly the local extrema of the first derivative. And these are going to be the places where the second derivative changes its signs.